Good evening. Welcome to City Council meeting of Wednesday, April 3rd, 2019. Can I have a roll call, please? Peg Conniff. Here. Salem Derby. Present. Omar Gomez. Here. J.P. Kaczynski. Here. Bill Lynch. Here. Joe McCoy. Here. Tom P. Here. Dan Riss. Here. Owen Zara. Here. Okay. Well, please all stand for Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Can I have a motion for the approval of the minutes of March 20th? So moved. Second. Motion a uh, second for the March 20th minutes. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any abstentions? Okay, motion passed. Public speak time. Is there anyone here from the public who would like to address the council for any topic other than what may be on the public hearing tonight? This is your opportunity. If you could just come to the podium, state your name and address. Okay. Me again, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Ann Tallheimer, 8 Clark Street, uh, apartment 2, Holyoke, Massachusetts. Um, I'm here again in support of uh, Councillor Zaret's <coughs> firearm safety and against gun violence resolution. Um, I have been following this through East Hampton and it's been awesome to watch it go through committee. I was at the subcommittee last night and it was the most pleasant, agreeable experience I've had, particularly in talking about um, both municipal government and gun legislation. So I wanted to just sort of uh, state praise for that. Um, but I, again, wanted to appear in support of this resolution. I think it's important. I think East Hampton can be particularly forward thinking in the adoption of this. And one of the things that I think is particularly important about it is that there's a focus on education, particularly around the red flag law, which is a new addition in Massachusetts. The chief of police was present last night and spoke about this. Um, we are also doing ad campaigns in Western Massachusetts specifically about um, the red flag law and the website is one thing you can do dot org which talks specifically about Massachusetts and how that works so that education component I think is really important um, <clears throat> but I wanted to again stand in support um, I appreciate this is going forward and I appreciate the care and concern and respect with which it's been discussed and my hope is to see it um, brought forward tonight and adopted for East Hampton and we in Holyoke will be looking to you as a model for that so <coughs> Um, we look forward to that in the future. Thank you again for um, letting me speak, particularly not as an East Hampton resident, but as a concerned citizen and voter and a gun violence survivor. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, communications from elected officials, boards, and committee, city planner, do you want to talk a bit about the One Ferry Street project, uh, utility? Is that anything you wanted to speak to, Jeff, or is it just move to subcommittee? <clears throat> I think that would be to move to subcommittee, so then it will Okay, we can move on then. Okay. Uh, Councilor Riss? I would like to take a moment of silence for a state police officer who was killed in a serious accident in Maine. My wife and I babysat uh, for the Campbells, and he's from East Hampton. I'd like to take a moment of silence when a police officer is killed in the line of duty. It's, it's a tragedy anywhere in this country. But he's from East Hampton. Thank you for bringing us, making us aware of that. Um, I do have, uh, I promised a constituent I would read a communication to the council, uh, slightly lengthy, but I'll try to get through it. Um, dear city council, I am wanting to let you know my feelings on the orange flag crosswalk situation all over the city. I'm asking that my, um, first I cannot imagine uh, losing someone to a crosswalk incident. We should all be on our highest awareness on any street. I am very concerned with how the situation is Moving beyond a reasonable action, emotions may be high, but not all agree with the current remedy. The streets have been commandeered by a couple of residents, apparently without oversight. The entire city looks like a construction zone, um, all by the hands of two dedicated citizens and a known number of supporters with good intentions. Um, not only have the aesthetics of the city been changed, but the flags have now become a distraction in themselves. They are everywhere, um, one's concentration uh, is mirrored in orange. As part of my need to know how this is happening, I have contacted the mayor's office, the city council president, my district rep four with two phone calls, and, uh, and I've yet to hear from them, DPW and the police. Uh, no one knows anything or how to deal with it. I would like to know that in one person's mind, uh, that for the safety of the community, they went throughout the city and placed 
Rainbow, oh, if someone had placed rainbow flags, Confederate flags, Earth flags, or MAGA flags at every cross, crosswalk or corner, would the city or residents find this acceptable? I don't think so. Uh, as for instance, I felt that a crosswalk we needed on a given street, would I be able to go and paint one? Um, I spoke to the mayor's office weeks ago and had a reasonable conversation. Um, they talked more about conversations with the mayor's office. Uh, my suggestion is that the city council take some uh, action. It can't, it can't work this way. I'm sorry, I have trouble reading some of it. Uh, remove the, I request remove the orange flags immediately and replace with uh, state sanctioned center of the road state law stop for pedestrians in yellow, red, or black that in some areas are in use but overtaken by the orange cones and flags. Um, the city and state signs have been strapped with flag holders, cones put in front of private homes and without asking anyone. The situation themselves would be uh, more effective not only as a more peaceful alert but a lawful one. Uh, through their desire to do something about a problem that should be taken seriously, another has been created. The opinions of others, many, and the aesthetics of our daily surroundings do not seem were in consideration. Uh, so I would ask that this be addressed now and not at some unspecified time with at least these stanchions. Um, one notion I have observed that there are no orange flags surrounding Williston Academy, uh, where they or the city has deployed only state sanctions signs, apparently appropriately doing the intended job. Um, sincerely, George I'm meeting in East Hampton, Massachusetts. So I told the citizen I would read his letter to, and the record, and it has been done. Uh, moving on, let me see, Mayor Communications, Mayor LaChapelle. Good evening. Um, I will, uh, we have had conversations with the constituent that you had uh, just read the letter. Um, and also checked in with the police chief again um, about the use of the flags. Um, at the Public Sa Safety Subcommittee some months ago, uh, both the chief and I um, were fine with the use of the flags as a temporary um, stopgap until the Complete Street grants that are focusing on crosswalks um, have been completed. And uh, we just uh, verified that again uh, Chief Alberti. Uh, that said, we have gotten requests from two other cities. One includes Palmer uh, to implement uh, this exact program with the orange flags uh, because they had seen it on the on the news. Um, there was another inquiry from uh, a community out east. I forget that name, but um, you know, I, there are many sides to one issue, so I, I wanted to to comment on that. Um, <coughs> I would also bring uh, to the attention of the council and uh, those watching or that will watch the, the tape of, of this meeting and many other meetings, um, our cable access um, service, uh, PEG access, our provider is East Hampton Media. They also provide services to South Hampton. Uh, the full scope of that coverage is um, in grave danger. Uh, the new FCC rules are looking at um, a new segment or um, a new part of the funding formula where their charter company, the cable companies, ours is charter, uh, needs to give 5% to the city for these access. They are looking in that 5% uh, to include any in-kind contributions um, that either the station, the city, or um, in the odd case, the cable company. Um, will get and subtract the in-kind from the 5% in revenue. Um, I would defer to Councilor Conniff of what percent of that 5% uh, from the cable provider is of the total budget of East Hampton um, media. Myself and other mayors are extremely concerned about this. Um, I personally uh, look at it as a First Amendment um, issue where free speech and um, information to the public would be severely um, hampered as well. Uh, the cable companies, if they are allowed to define what in-kind is, it could significantly limit the type of program, tone, and tenor of programming based on what is in-kind or not, taking away from the cash flow to peg access um, providers. So I wanted to um, one, I am very grateful 
uh, for the service of East Hampton Media and um, even more grateful for PEG services um, across our, our Commonwealth and inner city. It's, it's a great service. It allows the members of the public to see what we're doing as elected officials on their own time um, when they access that, um, when they, they access the website or our website uh, or watch as they are today. Um, as I get more information or perhaps um, uh, uh, opportunity for comment or weighing in on the next negotiation with the cable uh, companies, which is some, we're about mid-year through, uh, midway through our contract, uh, we'll let you know if these new regulations affect our existing contract and would again um, ask East Hampton Media um, to also keep us uh, informed as well as Councilor Conniff. Um I would speak to also the firearm safety um, resolution before this body tonight. I attended the, um, indeed, very thoughtful and kind, compassionate subcommittee meeting that discussed this and, um, and also brought uh, my mayor for the day, Dominic, um, who commented and highlighted um, what, what he thought was important in, in that resolution and would offer and encourage um, support for it and uh, ask this body uh, to endorse said resolution. I think that it is something that affects um, all too many people and families in this country. And uh, there is a real need to clarify how East Hampton uh, approaches and thinks about uh, firearm uh, safety. The educational component is also, um, I think, very important. Uh, there's a suggestion in um, that resolution that came out of subcommittee uh, that suggested strongly the mayor um, join an advocacy group that focuses on mayors um, every town um, thing. and I am you know I will say forwardly I am more than happy to join that group and joined mayors for our lives last year it's been a really great source of educational <clears throat> um, information um, uh, just a quick update on our school project and just the fiscal impact on our community um, with the amazing, um, really, talents and skills of our city auditor, Val Bernier, and finance director, um, Melissa Zwicky, um, we were able to attend, we were able to obtain a AA plus bond rating. There's only one bond rating above that, that's AAA. Um, the AAA bond rating for a city our size and where we are um, is, it's a huge jump, uh, AA plus. Um, it was a stretch for us, and because of the thoughtful financial planning, uh, forecasting, and um, fiscal policies that the city has observed for the last several years, and the realignment of our fiscal policies in the last year and a half, um, we were able to, to make a very persuasive case. Um, the double A plus bond rating is a, a certainly an amazing flag to um, investors around the country. Um, that East Hampton is worth investing in. We had a very competitive bond issue. Our bid went out. It was very competitive. We got some really great bids um, and have selected one. We're waiting for final paperwork. Um, this bond rating will result in millions of, of dollars in savings for our city over the course of this bond. It's, it's really, it's like one of those quiet savings that you, you know, we don't think about. Um, and, and we'll report out more details, um, hopefully by the next city council meeting, but as soon as they're available um, to, to let the, um, the back. And that is all I have. Any questions for the mayor before she talks? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I have one quick question. How old was Mayor Dominic? Uh, Mayor Dominic was nine. Okay. Uh, he was nine, and, um, and he was very helpful in preparing for the subcommittee meeting. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Um, let me see. Uh, maybe we can slip property in. No? Uh, or is it going to take too long? It's going to take okay. a little longer. Okay. Um, we can. Uh, Thank you for trying this. Sure. <laughs> we can open. I'll take a motion to open public hearings then. So moved. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion <coughs> passes. Uh, As passes. you know, the Finance Committee was charged with adopting the local room occupancy excise tax. We do not have motels or hotels in town. Uh, but we wanted to have something in place for the Airbnbs, which are blossoming all over the world and in our community. Um, we had a debate last time in these chambers 
about 3% versus 6%. And because our clerk, Barbara, wrote a very uh, convincing email to the mayor who wanted 3%, we were happy, we're happy to inform you that the mayor is okay with 6%, which as uh, the counselors mentioned at the last meeting, uh, Councilor Lynch especially, in a $50 per day Airbnb uh, rent, it's only $3 as opposed to $1.50, so it's not a big jump. And the thing that convinced me is we're not charging our own residents this tax. This is for people who want to come and visit for long-term rentals that might be longer than, what, 15 days? I forget that. But So we will be proposing a 6% effective tax. Okay. Uh, is there anyone from the city who would like to speak to this uh, adoption of the local room occupancy tax? No. Anyone from the public who would like to address the council concerning this? Okay, Councilor Riss, I'll entertain a motion. I move that the City of East Hampton accept MGL Chapter 64G, Section 3A to establish a local room occupancy excise tax at the rate of 6% with an effective date of July 1st, 2019. Second. Okay, a motion a second to approve <coughs> the adoption of MGL Chapter 64G, 3A, local room occupancy excise tax. Additional questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Motion passes. Move that we close the public hearing. Second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion passes. That was very quick. <laughs> uh, we can go on to uh, standing committees, and uh, as we have a guest here tonight, uh, so we're going to move to uh, property uh, first. So, Councilor Brzezinski. Thank you. Uh, we have before us an agreement and perpetual grant of easement for property off of Park Street. Uh, that easement would be for the rearmost section of the property uh, to the east and it would enable a small strip of land for the city to be able to have access to. The hope is that we would be able to connect over time Plain Street with the park. And this may take many, many years to begin to accumulate the proper easements. So we had uh, a gentleman, uh, Michael Zimmer from Soltage, uh, who's kind enough to have joined us today in case there were any questions about uh, the easement and its impact. Uh, this, this was presented to the property committee. We voted three to zero to move it forward with a recommendation favorably to the full council uh, with a little proviso that there be some language and adjustment at the planning board level. So the planning board considered a matter last night. Uh, our, what we picked up on was that in decommissioning, a potential decommissioning of the solar uh, arrays, they would be decommissioning the road. And we thought it would be important to not necessarily have to decommission the road. Uh, it would be something that the planning board at the time, 20 years from now, whatever, when the decommissioning came about, they could decide yay or nay whether that would occur. So although it's not it's part of the easement, it is part of the planning board. Jeff, I would like to call you up and Mr. Zimmer, just in case there are any questions, Jeff, and you may want to add a few things. This is a 3.1 megawatt solar array uh, of which the planning board had re been able to negotiate the, uh, the easement uh, subject to the property, uh, the, the uh, city council accepting the easement. If I left anything out, Jeff, please. Do you have a slide up there, Jeff? <laughs> well, I was going to try to use the technology that's in this room. So I think when that uh, go projector goes, it should go on. Um, so I, we do have Michael Zimmer from Soltage, which is a solar company here, to answer questions. Um, the packet that's with the with the uh, city council, you know, goes over that the planning department's requesting. Um, the approval of the easement over the private parcel to provide potential future pedestrian access. Um, the language was crafted by the city's attorney and reviewed and approved by the solar company. Um, as the background, the property owner, uh, Crown Meadow, uh, which is uh, the Gall family, has agreed to grant the city a permanent access agreement over a small portion of the large parcel. Um, so in doing this, we're, we're thankful to the property owner for for moving forward with us on granting this, it's important. So without the property owner's consent, we wouldn't be able to do this. 
um, between July and November 2018, uh, the solar company sought a special permit from the planning board for the development of a 3.1 megawatt solar array. It's on a vacant wooded parcel at 232 Park Street. So during the proceedings, Piscomic Conservation Trust identified that the full development of the property would prevent the vital potential future access across this, this piece of land. Um, the property owner and solar company agreed to provide the easement and the solar company expended funds towards uh, the preparation of the requisite survey and documents. So specifically, the easement crosses one of the two remaining properties necessary to complete an interconnected series of protected properties that extends from Plain Street, uh, starting at the Castina Conservation Area, and a patchwork of already existing protected open space that would ultimately either get to the Whitebrook School property or Nonatuck. Um, the creation of the easement marks a substantial step towards ensuring that the city has the right and the ability to, to cross this land in the future. So if I can do this with the new technology in this room, um, I believe, if you give me, give me one second, I am going to mirror the maps and images here. This is leading by example to show that there is no fear in doing this. <laughs> So, if I'm successful, this will be. We'll be seeing all your pictures. Of your <laughs> <laughs> the, I have the document up. Um, so some of these maps were in the the packet, but I think um, always with technology before it showed full screen. Oh, there we go. So on this map, at the at the bottom of the map is Plain Street. And in purple, you, this is a map by, prepared by Pascama Conservation Trust. So what they identified was that this um, potential trail network has been identified for at least 15 years. So this is, this is not a new concept. Um, on that's the, the red line? I'm the sorry. red line, yep, the red line. Um, so on the bottom of the map is Plain Street, and you can see Gustina Conservation Area, Chickenwin APR. Um, there is a private parcel. It's the... the um, the pork chop lot there, that green parcel, which is a, a private parcel that would be the, the final remaining piece of private property to cross. Um, just above that is pheasant run, open space. And then on the map, you can see in yellow is the proposed PV site. So um, the city does own some property to the right of that, but it's the city well, um, and there are more wetlands to the right. So um, this was identified as a, a possible route and then just north of that is um, a city-owned parcel um, where the dredge, dredge spoils from Nashawanic Pond are. Finally, to the north of that is the treehouse, open space, White Brook, and Nantuck to the, to the right. So it's just a general context. And through the planning board process, um, this is the long property that extends from Park Street is on the left. Um, the solar company will be installing an access road from Park Street um, through some fields, crosses uh, wetlands, and then there's the first array. Um, there's White Brook, which crosses the middle of the property, and then the second array. And the area that we're talking about is all the way to the right of that map. Um, it's the sort of the tail end of the solar array. And what started to become clear through the process is that the solar company will be installing this access road, and it will be improved, um, built, and maintained, and so there is going to be this road crossing through this area, and the desirable connection is at the bottom of that um, spur would be approximately 200 feet that the city down the road would potentially have to construct a connection. <coughs> so the next map shows sort of there are existing trails out in this vicinity. Um, the idea would potentially be that with this access, the city could continue to look at this more carefully um, design some other trail networks, enhance the trails that are out there. But without the easement, we wouldn't even really be having this conversation. So the easement covers the tail end of the property. And I had this last image here just for reference. So on the, on the left, this is sort of a cut sheet of what the solar company is constructing as the road. So it's a 15-foot wide gravel but stable ground. And um, we're working with the Conway School on a trail envisioning study and their, you know, their profile for a shared use, sort of multi-use path, shows a 10 to 12 foot wide 
sort of gravel improved path area. So there are some potential for this to happen in the future. I think, as Councilor Kwasinski said, this, is, this may take 10, 20 years. But with the solar arrays being there for 20 years, this was a key opportunity for us to pursue this. Okay. Um, any questions for the City Planning Council Rist? A couple questions. Uh, some of these don't, I just want to make sure the residents know this. We're only approving the easement this Correct. evening. This solar array has been approved by the planning board. Correct. And it's all done. It's not been constructed. This is. But the permit's been issued. <coughs> permit's been issued, and as a condition, the, you know, the company comes to to get this easement, you know, and cooperates with the city to get the easement. So we're we're working well with the solar company to do this. Just because the residents are watching, how does the how does the solar arrays power get? Is it go right to the grid, or how does uh, are residents able to access it in any way? I mean, how does that work? That all defer to the solar company. Just because people are going to sure. ask. So it's um. It's a three megawatt solar array, as was referenced earlier. And by the way, Mike Zimmer from Soltage. Thank you for having me tonight. Uh, the, the power is connected directly to the utility grid on Park Street, the three phase line that you see there today. Um, effectively, all of the electricity is sold to the grid. Um, and uh, what the utility is required to allow us to do uh, is also offer credits um, to sell to individual participants, homeowners, businesses under what's called community solar. Um, and so technically the energy goes to the grid, um, but this project will also be participating in a community solar program, um, which um, generally community solar programs are subscribed to uh, subscribers. They have to be within the utility territory, which is Eversource West, formerly Wamiko. Um, they certainly could be East Hampton residents if they're interested, uh, but they would have no obligation to participate. Uh, but there will be a campaign to find um, residences, small businesses that want to buy credits from this project at a discount to save money um, and support the development projects like this. Um, so there's no direct connection to anyone's home, um, any load in the city, uh, but we are certainly pursuing this community solar effort that does generate clean, low cost energy at a savings to uh, really anyone in Western Mass. Um, so, yeah, one last question. Jeff, how about a Butters? What, what were they at the meetings or any at the planning board? Yeah, the I know there is a good, um, I forget the word, protection. Buffer. Buffer. <laughs> and it's also with uh, plantings and stuff to keep it from visibility right nearby. Yeah, in the introduction, I, I did note that the proceedings went from July to November. So um, that was many, yeah, that was many months of hearing, but hearings overall, um, it was a very good and collaborative um, discussion between the planning board, the solar company and the abutters who primarily it's the abutters on Holly Circle. Mm. Um, and uh, the, the solar company gets a lot of credit for um, being flexible, for listening, and for making changes that ultimately gave the abutters the opportunity to say that this, this is a project that works even though it's next to them. Um, so there were a lot of wins on this one, and the planning board chair did a good job of commending the solar company and the abutters who um, worked collaboratively to, I mean, it's a large project. It's a, it's a forested site. It's not virgin forest. It, it used to be a, a field, um, but it still was enough of a change from what's out there today that you know there are a lot of trees that are going to come out of there, but um, the company did a, a really good job of leaving the buffer um, adjacent to Holly Street um, and really listened to the concerns of the neighbors. So, so they went above, above and beyond um, twice, so to, to satisfy the concerns of the butters and to provide the easement over the end of the property. Thank you very much. Good to hear. Did you have a question? Just following up on uh, Mr. Zimmer's comments about what the public can buy into, how would the public learn about the credits or anything else that may be available to them, the usage? Um, so the, the, the contact communication has not really yet been determined. Uh, typically what we do is we use a third party um, that is familiar with soliciting interest in credits from solar projects like this uh, and they they'll conduct a campaign with flyers some sort of marketing um, 
perhaps folks on the street uh, to identify homeowners that want to participate. Um, so I, it's not a great answer, uh, but certainly if, if the city has an interest in um, in some way, I don't want to suggest promoting this, but uh, having us share this directly with the constituents here, we'd be happy to. Um, but nothing is really set in stone yet. That's kind of the next step as we, um, you know, the, the first hurdle here is to get a building permit so we can build a project. Thank you. The follow-up step is to find the off-takers. I know this is a little beside the point, but just out of curiosity, how many households would a, a project of this size power? Okay, so this project is about three megawatts. That delivers about four million kilowatt hours in a year. The average house uses about 10,000 kilowatts a year. Um, so, so that's a lot. <laughs> so would that be, um, I believe, 4,000? Um, unless I'm off by a decimal point. The, um, I think you are. It's likely that a large portion will go to a single entity. Um, and this gets more related to how you finance projects. Uh, so ideally, half of all that offtake will go to a large entity like a city like East Hampton or a large commercial entity that has a large load to take that much power. And the, the second half would go to the smaller constituents, which would be small houses. So more likely, it would be more like 2,000 um, individuals, or individual homes, I should say. Uh, but it could be up to 4,000. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor I just wanted to point out something that was discussed uh, during the subcommittee meeting um, in regards to the access road, just in case anyone else, uh, this occurs to anyone else. Uh, obviously, potentially with the advent of a trail network sometime in the future, uh, it did occur to us that having access or an easement to the entirety of the access road might be beneficial, but it was pointed out to us, and you can, you can go further into detail on this if you'd like to, that this road is really only suitable for single-way traffic, infrequent single-way traffic for utility vehicles and emergency vehicles. So. We did seeing we did at least ask that question if that would be worthwhile for the the city to investigate a, a broader easement, but the the because the, the the design of the access road isn't really suitable for that type of use. Okay. Any additional questions for uh, the city planner, Mr. Zimmer? I think the one thing I would just throw out there that didn't really get mentioned. I think in terms of the benefit, so where maybe a resident needs something doesn't directly benefit from the actual solar, um, the city in general does get tax revenue from a project like this. So the company worked with the Board of Assessors and signed a, a, pilot, pro, a pilot agreement, so it's payment in lieu of taxes. So the city gets, you know, it's not a huge amount of tax revenue, but it's more than um, the property is generating now. So that is a benefit to the city overall. So that's over the course of the lifetime of the array there's consistent tax revenue every year from a project like this, so that is a benefit. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, Thanks. Kwasinski. <clears throat> if there are no further questions, I'd like to make a motion. Sure. I move that the City Council authorize the Mayor to approve the agreement and perpetual grant of easement between the City of East Hampton and Crown Meadow Corporation, granting the inhabitants of the City of East Hampton, Massachusetts and its successors for use by the public at large, an irrevocable, perpetual, non-exclusive easement to utilize cross and recross that portion of the Crown property shown as trail easement to the City of East Hampton on the plan of land entitled Trail Easement Map, shown as Exhibit A and dated March 28, 2019. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the uh, easement uh, for the solar array off of Park Street. Additional questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion passes. This concludes our report. That concludes. Okay. And we go back to finance and council lists. Thank you, Mr. President. Finance Committee will meet next Wednesday the 10th at 5 p.m. We'll continue our discussion of the uh, classification pay plan that's been forward. I'd like to make a motion to set a public hearing for that ordinance, both Exhibits A and B, for our next meeting. Motion 615 in these chambers. Second. Okay, a motion and a second. I set a public hearing um, April 17th for the classification play plan exhibits A and B. Additional questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion passes. Um, just to report, uh, <coughs> Chapter 32B, Sections 21 and 22 negotiations are ongoing.
with the city's collective bargaining units. And I'd like to also bring into new business a first reading in departmental transfer. The amount requested is $6,100 to be transferred from band principal account, $6,100, to be transferred to band interest account, $6,100, for the following purpose, interest expenses. Um, I move that this be sent to the Finance Committee for review, and it will be on our next agenda. Second. We have a motion and a second to move the interdepartmental transfer of $6,100 to finance for additional review, additional questions or comments. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion passes. May I um, ask Finance Director, does this need to get a public hearing immediately? Just shake your hands. You can come up here. So I'd like to set a public hearing for uh, the, uh, at the next meeting for this uh, for the 17th, for the aforementioned uh, $6,100, please. Second. Got okay, a motion to second to send a public hearing for the interdepartmental transfer of $6,100. April 17th, additional questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, abstain. Motion passes. Second. Okay, I believe next, uh, Public Safety Councilor Gomez. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I want to start with the new businesses. I want to send, I want to make a motion to send joint utility request for two poles relocation for one Ferry Street project, the Verizon request of, for a conduit location for one Ferry Street, Street project, request for an Eversource to install a conduit duct bank for one for one Ferry Street project, and the ASMA request to bury utility line install concrete pad and transformer for one Ferry Street project to our next meeting. It's going to be April 16 at 6 p.m. at uh, room A, uh, and I want to. There was a phone. Was okay. Second so first. Okay. So okay. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, motion a second. Of public safety. Additional questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. Um, motion passes. Um, again, um, this is a little bit usual that we're taking that easement um, to uh, public safety. Although you know, for the con continuity of the project, I think it makes sense. But certainly, Council Kwasinski, please, you know, with your experience in easements, please uh, play a role in this as well. Okay, Council Gomez. Thank you, Mr. <coughs> President. And make a I want to make a motion to do a public hearing for all these topics for the uh, meeting of the April 17 at 6:15 in this chamber. Okay, is there a second? Second. Okay, motion and second for pu set public hearings for the previously four red topics. Um, April 17th in these chambers public hearing. Additional questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed, abstain. Motion passes. Um, <clears throat> this afternoon I give you a package of the uh, acceptance of Fox, Fox Run uh, as a public way. Um, we, as a committee design, that, that we're going to uh, make a motion for the next meeting, not tonight, because we're waiting for the uh, for the deed. They, there's no sign yet, so that's why we're not making any motion tonight for for us up the, the, this way. So we're going to uh, wait until the next meeting. But I, I, I give it to you the package with the, all the information that we need to accept it. Uh, that way you can read it. If you have any questions, so we can answer at the next meeting. Um, uh, Beside that, we have a meeting last night, and we talk about parking and and the crosswalks, and the way they came all together, because um, some of the parking spot that we have, we probably we want to work in our demonstrate to uh, see if we can just save those spot ne next to set set those parking slot for uh, next to the crosswalk just for small cars instead of having vans or big cars there. Uh, we're going to have a conversation with the police chief, uh, with the mayor and DPW to see how we can do that. Um, and we're going to move into that direction because we don't want to lose any parking spot, in, uh, especially now there are more businesses that are coming to our city. Uh, we, we don't want to do that. Uh, so we're going to try to figure it out how we can combine those two for the safety of the pedestrian at the same time saving those parking, parking slot. Um, we, like I said, we, we schedule a meeting uh, for the April 16th. Uh, we're going to uh, keep continuing that conversation. Uh, and we're going to include the, the chief, uh, DPW, and the mayor of it, on it. Uh, Is that a meeting on the 16th or the 17th? So the 17th? The 16th. Okay. The 16th. Uh, we're going to have a, uh, the meeting at 16th uh, for the request of the polls and all that. Mm -hmm. uh, 
But our request reading is the 17th, is that right? right. Okay. Yes, and the okay. Francis Council is going to be the 17th. Uh, and that's concluded. Okay, thank you very much. Appointments, okay. Councilor. Uh, uh, we had one mayoral appointment to review this evening, uh, Kathy Parker on the Commission on Disability. Um, I spoke to Kathy, and I'll try and from memory, I had lovely notes mm -hmm. that I left at home. Um, <clears throat> Kathy recently moved here from Austin, Texas, I believe last August. She moved, uh, in her words, to follow her grandchildren. Um, her daughter and grandchildren moved here. Uh, her grandchildren are disabled, and part of the impetus of moving to Massachusetts was the more welcoming and more programs available to the disabled. Um, there was not that much available in Texas, and it was a, a, a drawback to continue to live there. And um, so <coughs> they did research, and, and they landed in Massachusetts, and they were looking for this particular area. And they love East Hampton, and one of the, the big draws as they were driving around looking for a place to live was the signs that say, all are welcome here. They were really happy to see all of that. It was a different vibe than they were getting out of Texas. Um, so really happy to be here. She, um, she is also on the Pascomic Trust uh, Commission, and um, what else am I forgetting? Oh. She uh, used to live in the western part of Maryland and was very interested in participating in their local government, going to city council meetings, going to school board meetings, and she looks forward to that here. She did not get, uh, she was not able to do that in Austin because of the way that city is so large. And uh, so she was really excited to be here. She, she's very interested in solving issues and um, looks to work uh, always to uh, make things better with positive intent. So uh, really lovely conversation with her. Really happy uh, to move her forward to City Council. We uh, unanimously approved her to move forward uh, to this council. <clears throat> I will now, uh, unless there's any conversation, I will make a motion to approve Kathy Parker on the Commission on Disability with a term expiration of December 31st, 2021. Second. A motion and a second to approve the appointment of Kathy Parker to the Commission on Disability. Additional yes. questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Abstain? Motion passes. We have no new business for appointments, so we have no meeting scheduled and thus concludes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Ordinance, Councilor Derby. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, <clears throat> ordinance did meet uh, we've been busy lately. Uh, we met on the 26th uh, where we discussed the Welcoming Community Trust Ordinance. That came out uh, with a favorable um, three to zero uh, recommendation to bring to the full council. However, I'm not, I'm gonna hold off setting a public hearing for that until we get um, the city attorney's review. Um, we do have a upcoming meeting, uh, which is on uh, the 9th at 5.15. Uh, we're going to have all items on our agenda um, to discuss. Uh, and then uh, we also have, uh, as we have ongoing meetings now, the 23rd, uh, April 23rd at 5.15 as well. Um, I just want to put out there that now the can cannabis equity application has been sent to the planning board. Uh, one of the ordinance uh, members is going to go to the planning board meeting on the 16th to discuss it. Um, or introduce it, uh, and then from that we will uh, set a joint public hearing uh, to bring that uh, further down uh, towards uh, its goal. Uh, okay, Council Brist. Uh The Welcoming Trust Ordinance, I assume there were some amendments, Council uh, Derby, at the subcommittee level? Mm -hmm. There could was that, could more that be revisions, I think, well, as opposed to call. amendments, yeah. I, I, I was wondering if uh, you could send that document to the full council. I would be happy to. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Oh, and I do have some new business here. Um, so uh, in the form of no motion, I would like uh, to send the planning board's request to amend zoning ordinance uh, regarding zero lot lines in the mill industrial district to ordinance. Second. Okay, a motion a second to move a request to amend zoning ordinance uh, zero lot lines in the Mill Industrial District. Additional questions or comments? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, abstain. Motion passes. That concludes. Okay, we've done property. Uh, rules of Government Relations, Councilor Peak. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, rules and Government Relations met last night uh, with the Mayor, the Chief, the 
mayor for the day uh, and uh, a handful of members of the community um, to discuss the firearms safety and against gun violence resolution. Um, I thought it was a productive meeting. Uh, in addition to discussing the body of the uh, of, of the uh, resolution, we also had a very educational conversation with the police chief about what um, gun control in Massachusetts currently looks like and, and the, the, uh, the duties that fall to his department. Um, there was also some, some good community feedback uh, that was incorporated into the draft of the resolution that you see today. Um, since this is uh, Councillor Zaret's proposed resolution, I'd like to give him an opportunity to speak to this. Uh, but just so you know, uh, the uh, subcommittee voted three to zero to recommend that we adopt this resolution. Councillor Zaret. Thank you, Councillor Peek, and the rest of the members of the council. Um, uh, I, I know all of you read the cover letter that accompanied the initial submission of uh, this, this resolution to the City Council. Um, certainly I have found myself in my adult life feeling frustrated and helpless with the mounting travesties and what's become an epidemic in this country of mass shootings. Um, for me, it started with Columbine. I know there were incidents before that, but it seems like after that with Sandy Hook and Parkland and The Pulse, in Las Vegas and the Tree of Life Synagogue and many, many others that it seems like there's a problem in our country. And I want to make it clear that this resolution is not against responsible gun ownership. I've, I've been a gun owner in the past. I firmly believe in proper application of the Second Amendment, but we have to do something to stop these incidents and these travesties and these murders from happening. Um, it's also important to note that advocating for gun safety also protects our law enforcement and they're often very oftentimes victims of improper of people who are improperly possessing firearms um, additionally it's important to know and I, I flipped the numbers around yesterday um, but uh, the one of the there's a re incredible amount of people who take their own lives uh, from firearms I believe it's 24,000 so there, it, this comes down to public safety. And a lot of people have commented to me, well, we don't have a problem with this in East Hampton. And, I'm, and I say to myself, thank goodness that we don't. But Sandy Hook didn't have a problem with it either. And neither did Parkland and, and neither did Las Vegas. And so I'm not trying to fear monger here because I hope to God that it never should come to pass that we should have to worry about a mass shooting um, in our community, but it can happen here as it has happened in many other places without warning. Um, I commented yesterday that the fact that we have to design our new school with designs around an active shooter scenario is a sad state of affairs. Um, I think it's, it, um, it's important to read one of the uh, items here, and I'll read the resolution in a moment. <laughs> Um, but it's important to note again that support for Second Amendment rights of law-abiding citizens goes hand in hand with keeping guns away from dangerous people. Um, I've been working on this for many months. After the vigil that we held as a community for the Tree of Life Synagogue, I sat down with the Chief of Police and I said, well, what can I do? And you know, fortunately, in our state of Massachusetts, we have very strong gun laws and we have a wonderful police department that cares about gun safety and, and making sure that licenses are given out to responsible owners. Um, and so people will claim, well, this doesn't have teeth. Well, maybe it doesn't have teeth. I mean, the mayor is gonna sign, is, has said that she will sign on uh, to, um, to mayors against illegal guns. But I think as community members, and in our case, elected officials, it's important to take a stand in what we believe in. And in, in regards to having teeth, I, for one, if this passes tonight, will write letters to both my state and federal legislators showing them what we've done here and telling them that, we, that these, are the, these are the sentiments that are represented from East Hampton that we firmly believe in these things. Um, I want to thank Moms, Again, uh, Moms Demand Action 
for being here as they have been throughout the process. <laughs> uh, they've been very helpful in providing feedback in regards to this resolution. I've been in communication with Every Town for Gun Safety, Orange Ribbons for Jamie. <laughs> I was able to get a copy of one of the early drafts to Fred Gutenberg, whose daughter unfortunately died during the Parkland shootings. Um, and again, the, 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 the chief has been very instrumental uh, right along from the start to finish in terms of providing feedback and, and helping, um, and helping uh, uh, concoct this resolution. So um, would it be appropriate to now make a motion and, and should I read it? In yeah, I would actually read it and then make a motion to accept it. Maybe. Okay, so I will read, now read the resolution in, in, in its entirety with very few <coughs> minor changes that again, um, I want to thank uh, Jan Dreisick and uh, Wes Hardy who aren't here tonight, but they came to the meeting last night and I was actually very heartened uh, for the input that they were able to provide as well, which, uh, affect, which provides some of the changes here. So resolution for firearm safety and against gun violence, City Council of East Hampton. Whereas every day 100 Americans are killed by gun violence and Americans are 20, more, 20 times more likely to be murdered with guns than people in other developed countries. And more than 150,000 students attending more than 170 primary and secondary schools have experienced a shooting on campus since the Columbine High School massacre in 1999. And whereas from Columbine to Virginia Tech to Sandy Hook to Parkland, the lives of hundreds of students and school employees have been lost to the plague of gun violence. And whereas our children have the need and the right to go to school in order to learn and grow, and they should be able to do so without fear. And whereas there were 340 mass shootings in 2018, and whereas there have been 328 deaths and 1,251 people injured from mass shootings in 2018, and whereas from Charleston to Las Vegas to Pittsburgh to Orlando to Thousand Oaks, the lives of hundreds of adults have been lost in places where they should be free to exercise, congregate, and pray. Whereas our nation is grieving and heartbroken due to the ongoing gun violence throughout the land, especially as it has affected our children in schools in Florida, Colorado, Connecticut, Virginia, and other states, and whereas our police officers and other first responders have suffered trauma and grave losses, and the International Association of Chiefs of Police and the National Law Enforcement Memorial Fund advocate for the adoption of common sense policies to assist in reducing gun violence, and whereas the largest number of gun deaths is related to suicide in the order of close to 24,000 people a year. Whereas support for the Second Amendment rights of law-abiding citizens goes hand in hand with keeping guns away from dangerous people, whereas protecting public safety in the communities they serve is one of the most serious and fundamental responsibilities of elected officials, and whereas each attack sees renewed calls from the public for meaningful and constitutional measures to reduce gun violence. We therefore resolve that our local and state government representatives request the mayor to join Mayors Against Illegal Guns to join over a thousand current and former mayors committed to addressing gun violence. Encourage local law enforcement to use their role as community leaders to educate the public about local gun violence patterns and serve as advocates for measures that will have an impact. Provide resources to educate the public on responsible gun storage and gun safety protocols. Provide resources to educate the public on extreme risk protection order law as a tool to prevent gun violence, including reducing the risk of suicide by firearms. We further resolve that our federal government representatives enact universal background checks on all potential firearm sales throughout the U.S. to keep guns out of the hands of those who should not have them. Enact gun trafficking measures that will prevent straw purchases that circumvent background check laws. Prevent sales to individuals with a history of violent crimes or domestic abuse by ensuring that background check databases are kept current. Vote no on concealed carry reciprocity. Prohibit the sale of high capacity magazines and assault weapons as defined by federal law. Adequately fund the Center for Disease Control to study the public health impact of and measures for reducing gun violence. Promote research and development of smart gun technology to reduce accidental shootings. We further resolve to communicate these resolutions to our local, state, and federal representatives via direct communication, mail, and electronic communication. We will support firearm policies from our community and continue to be advocates for firearm safety for the city of East Hampton. And I'd like to make a motion that this be accepted by the city council tonight. I'll second. second. <laughs> yeah, you can pick that one out, Barb. <laughs> <laughs> okay, a motion is second to accept this resolution. Any additional questions or comments? Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, abstain, motion passes. And, uh,
this concludes. That concludes. Okay, Charter Review, Councilor Rist. So, the Charter Review Committee has made a great deal of progress. There's two things this council should know. The Charter Review Committee will be submitting to the council and a city attorney for review two, currently two acts to request the legislature allow for the position, and I feel, on the ballot for ranked <laughs> choice voting in the, in the uh, election of a mayor, which was approved by the, um, the Charter Review Committee. And recently, we, rev we reviewed and adopted um, a four-year term for the position of mayor. So both of those can be put on the ballot and can be put on as separate questions. So if residents aren't happy with one, it doesn't bump the other. This is very important to me as a counselor because I want to make sure when we put questions out there, um, they're not all in one, one package and therefore if somebody's upset with one part of it, they don't get to um, vote the whole thing down. Um, this will be sent, we want to do this quickly so that there's a review required by the city attorney, there's a review required by this council and the mayor has to adopt it and then it goes to the state legislature and because it's a ballot question, we need to get it done by September and we know how government is slow. So I am hopeful that after discussing this with the Charter Review Committee, we may be able to get this to the city council. These two acts, not the full charter review, we're going to do that as a separate act, the rest of it. Um, these two acts by hopefully the first or second meeting in May for review. And of course, if amendments are requested, that is fine. Because this is a council committee. Okay. Questions, Council Connor? Uh, what was the rationale around um, limiting, which is kind of a strange word, changing the term for mayor only? We discussed at length uh, whether we should do it for the school committee and have uh, and the city council. The discussion centered on two things. One was that um, commitment was a big issue for four years, um, and we worried that it would be harder to get people because that's a long commitment. And secondly, um, the uh, the ability of the council to have alternate. Um, elections so that the whole council doesn't leave. Councilor Gomez was very good to point out that that's never occurred and is a rare thing, is not a reason to do the four year terms. And we also looked at the fact that a number of cities and towns have the mayor at four years, like Northampton, but not the council. So that was the big debate um, at that level. And it was pretty much a consensus that we didn't want to do it for the councilors and the uh, school committee at this time. But the four-year term for the mayor was strongly supported because it allows a mayor projects like one Ferry Street, which take a while to get going. The mayor should have the ability in the future to continue those projects over a four-year term rather than have to run for re-election every second year of the term, and that's busy. So that was the uh, that was the gist of the conversation. Okay, thank you, Council Chair. And and to follow up to that, what was the rationale to adopt or to consider adoption of ranked choice voting for only the uh, mayoral election and not to adopt that as a novel um, uh, election uh, voting method for all of uh, elected municipal officials? There's a lot of debate. Um, one of the issues surrounded uh, the administration, especially for multi-winner elections. The single election <coughs> of, say, precinct councilors and the mayor was relatively, the mayor's election was uh, fairly well uh, I would say supported by the committee. And we looked at, we had a lot of good input, firstly from Councilor Peak and the Resource Center. And um, we felt that, uh, we talked about it also for two and a half meetings with large community uh, input. Um, the adoption of the mayor is something that's done quite often, whereas the smaller races, there was a lot of discussion whether we needed it or not. Um, and the administration of a, to start us off with the mayor's race would be easy to get us going. It's a little simpler. And it is the only race in the history of our council with having more than, with one, only one election after all of these years that, in which a ranked choice voting situation would have greatly helped uh, so that we had one mayor, Mayor Tazik was elected with only 30% of the vote in the first election. There was a couple of other elections like that but uh, ranked choice voting would only have applied to that mayor's race. 
Um, I think, am I right on that? Uh, no, there was a second mayoral race. Well, yeah, but it would have applied to the mayor. I meant as the mayor, yeah. not in the uh, council races. So we debated it at length, and as other members on the committee can speak to it, um, we felt that administration of a multi-winner <coughs> election was difficult for the, uh, especially for the clerk of the of elections. So we really debated that at length and felt that to start us off, the mayor should be the one. It is the primary election that we do, the most important position in the community, um, and that full-time mayor, uh, we felt that was very important. I, I wasn't prepared to speak to this tonight, so I don't have any notes. So I hope you my other colleagues can, can, did a good job. Yeah. If, if Councilor Peek or Councilor Gomez or Councilor McCoy want to say anything, I thought I wasn't really ready to debate that. I thought when I brought it forward, I'd debate it all. But. We're very inquisitive. <laughs> You're allowed. That's I just nice want, I should bring my notes anymore. <laughs> okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. Oh, we're meeting next, next week. We're going to finalize that language and move on to Article 6. We're going backwards because we did Article 7 elections in order to deal with elections. So next Thursday, the 11th at 6 p.m. in Room 1, we will be debating Article 6. And one of those is the uh, Department of Public Works, which will get, gather some uh, interesting conversation. <laughs> Okay, I believe we've gone, we have no old business. I think we've gone through all the new business, so entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, abstain. Motion passes. See you we April. have to sign the resolution, is that correct, Barbara? 17. Yes.